Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. Today we're going to look at an absolutely fundamental concept in chemistry, and one which many students struggle to understand, I know. Moles. We will look at what a mole is, its history, why we need moles in the first place, and do some sample calculations. So, if you've never been clear on the concept of moles, settle in and let's burrow into the concept. First things first, moles are about counting. Counting things is very important if we want to know how many things we have of something. If you can guess how many oranges are in this bag, I'll give you both of them. <sighs> or if we want to compare different things. What are you doing? I'm comparing apples and oranges. <sighs> now, that's quite easy if we have big things that we can see with our eyes. But it's a lot harder when we're talking about things we can't see, like molecules or atoms. 200 years ago, when chemists were first identifying the elements, they realised that they needed to characterise them. The first thing they needed was their mass. But of course, <laughs> atoms are very small, so are very tricky to measure. The English chemist John Dalton suggested a very clever solution. He defined the atomic mass of hydrogen, which was known to be the smallest element, as one. Then he said the masses of all the other elements should be stated relative to that of hydrogen. This is where the term relative atomic mass comes from. For example, it was known that the mass of helium was exactly four times that of hydrogen, so its relative atomic mass became four. Carbon is 12 times the mass of hydrogen, so its relative atomic mass is 12, and so on. At the time of Dalton, the subatomic structure of atoms wasn't known. Actually, I'm not sure we still do know, but that's a discussion for another day. But his proposal of relative atomic masses caught on, because it was known that elements reacted together in exact ratios, or stoichiometries. So relative atomic masses were very useful to work out what was happening in chemical reactions, even while scientists were arguing about atomic structure. As it turns out, current atomic theory says that atoms comprise protons, neutrons and electrons. The protons and neutrons form the nucleus and are called nucleons, and the electrons form a cloud around it. Electrons have almost zero mass, so the protons and neutrons are responsible for nearly all the mass of an element. Although we didn't know it at the time, because a hydrogen atom comprises one proton and one electron, by defining its mass as one, Dalton had really defined the mass of a nucleon, and this mass is now known as the Dalton. Chemists quickly realised that when they measured the masses of different elements, the results were always a whole number of Daltons. And this is what led them to conclude that atoms must be comprised of increasing numbers of the same building blocks. As the structure of the elements was worked out, it was discovered that elements could be identified by their number of protons. The number of protons is the atomic number. Carbon is element number six, for instance, because its nucleus has six protons. But the relative atomic mass of an element is how much more it weighs experimentally than hydrogen. And this is usually higher than the atomic number, because the measured mass comes from both the number of protons and the number of neutrons. The relative atomic mass of carbon is 12, because its nucleus has six protons and six neutrons. This is also why we say one atom of carbon weighs 12 Daltons its mass coming from 12 nucleons. As chemists tried to understand more about the elements, being able to know their masses with greater accuracy became ever more important. The Swedish chemist Jons Jakob Berzelius suggested using the mass of oxygen as the value to which other elements were compared, because oxygen reacts with lots of other elements. But unfortunately, he arbitrarily chose a mass of 100, which did not catch on. 
the relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16. In the 1960s, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures decided that relative atomic masses should be based on carbon, probably because it's a lot easier to obtain and handle solid carbon than solid hydrogen. They defined this mass as 12. So, by definition then, the nucleus of carbon has six protons, six neutrons and a mass of exactly 12 daltons. And the masses of all the other elements are defined relative to it. What does this have to do with moles? I hear you ask. Now, that is a very good question, especially as that is what this video is supposed to be about. Relative atomic masses are fine if we want to look at stoichiometries, but they're not so good if we want to actually count the number of molecules. And we need to do that if we want to work out concentrations or masses, for instance. Scientists are very good at expressing things in terms of standard units. So at the same time as defining the relative atomic mass of carbon as 12, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures also defined a way of counting molecules. They said that the number of atoms contained in 12 grams of carbon is equivalent to one mole. Why did they choose the word mole, you might wonder? I think it's because they're using it to count molecules. And mole is simply a shortened version of the word molecule. It's just a shame that in English at least, mole also means... Uh -huh. hmm. Mole is also a translation of the term mol, which the German chemist Wilhelm Oswald first used in 1897 again as a contraction of the word molecule. Anyway, one mole is defined as the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon. And why did they choose 12 grams of carbon? Because 12 is the relative atomic mass of carbon. Since the masses of all the other elements are defined relative to that of carbon, this definition therefore means that you will have one mole of any compound if the mass of your sample in grams is the same as the compound's relative molecular mass. Remember, a molecule is made up of atoms. So, for instance, methane has the chemical formula CH4. Its relative molecular mass is then 12 for carbon plus four for the four hydrogens, giving a total of 16. Therefore, one mole of methane would weigh 16 grams, or 16 grams of methane would contain one mole of molecules. Carbon dioxide has the formula CO2. Its relative molecular mass is then 12 for the carbon plus 32, 16 for each of the oxygen atoms, giving a total of 44. One mole of carbon dioxide would therefore weigh 44 grams. So that's all a mole is. <laughs> it's simply a number of molecules. As it happens, the number of molecules in 12 grams of carbon. And you always have one mole of a material if your sample mass in grams is the same as its relative molecular mass. Now, you might say to me, OK, Simon, you keep saying one mole is a number of molecules. How many molecules is that exactly? And why don't we just use that number instead? And I would say, if it's all right with you, I'll answer the second part of that question first. The reason we don't state the actual number of molecules in one mole is because the number is enormous, mind-blowingly massive, in fact. So to answer the first part of the question, it's 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. Or, if you want to see that written out, it looks like this. That's huge. So it's much easier to say one mole. <laughs> but this big number does have a name, Avogadro's number, or Na. You might also notice that Avogadro's number doesn't just contain zeros after the 6.02. That's because scientists like to define things exactly. And in 2019, surprisingly recently, in my opinion, the exact number of molecules in one mole was defined as 6.02214076 times 10 to the power of 23. Now, Knowing what a mole is, is all very well. 
but how do we use it to do something useful? Well, that's why I've been talking about relative molecular mass. If you know the relative molecular mass of a compound, then you know that if you have that amount of the material in grams, you have one mole of it. So, if you have 12 grams of carbon, you have one mole. How many moles would there be in 24 grams of carbon? I'll give you a moment to think about that. The answer would be two. And in 36 grams of carbon? Three. I hope you can see the pattern there. The number of moles is given by the sample mass divided by the relative molecular mass, which we can write like this. This equation is very useful, because if we know two of the terms, we can always calculate the third. Let me show you. A student weighs out 14 grams of potassium hydroxide, relative molecular mass 56. How many moles are in the sample? We put the numbers we know into the equation. Number of moles equals weight in grams, 14, divided by the relative molecular mass, 56, which gives us 0.25 moles. A student weighs out 23.4 grams of sodium chloride, relative molecular mass, 58.5. How many moles are in the sample? Again, we put the numbers we know into the equation. Number of moles equals weight in grams, 23.4, divided by the relative molecular mass, 58.5, which gives us 0.4 moles. How much would 0.05 moles of iron 3 oxide weigh in grams? Relative molecular mass, 160. Again, we put the numbers we know into the equation. Number of moles, 0.05, equals weight in grams, which is what we want to know, divided by the relative molecular mass, 160. Now we need to rearrange. If we are dividing by something on the right-hand side of an equation, we multiply it by it on the left-hand side. So we get number of moles, 0.05, multiplied by the relative molecular mass, 160, equals weight in grams, which gives us eight grams. Have a go at putting numbers into the equation yourself, and you'll soon get used to the calculation. We can also use moles to define concentrations. Concentrations tell us how much of something is dissolved in a solvent, often water. What do you call a glass of water with a tooth in it? I don't know. A one molar solution. That was terrible. Anyway, if we dissolve, one mole of a compound in one litre of water, we have a one molar solution, which we write as 1m. So when you see that 1m, now you know what it means. One mole of molecules in every litre of water. How do we calculate that? Since concentration is the number of moles of something in a given volume of liquid, we can write this. Concentration equals number of moles divided by volume of solvent in litres. But hang on, we already know that the number of moles is given by the sample mass divided by the relative molecular mass. So we can modify the equation like this. A student dissolves 14.625 grams of sodium chloride, relative molecular mass, 58.5, in half a litre of water. What is the concentration, molar, of the solution? We put the numbers we know into the equation. Concentration equals weight in grams, 14.625, divided by the relative molecular mass, 58.5, all divided by the volume, 0.5, which gives us 0.5 molar. How much sodium hydroxide, relative molecular mass 40, would need to be dissolved in 250 millilitres of water to make a two molar solution? Again, we put the numbers into the equation. Concentration, two molar, equals weight in grams, which is what you want to know, divided by the relative molecular mass, 40, all divided by the volume, 0.25. Now we need to rearrange a little bit. First off, 
If we are dividing by the volume on the right hand side of the equation, we must multiply by the volume on the left hand side of the equation. Then we can do the same thing with the relative molecular mass. It's dividing on the right hand side, so we multiply it on the left and we end up with 20 grams. What about if there are two types of compound dissolved in the same amount of water? No problem. A student dissolves 7 grams of potassium hydroxide, relative molecular mass 56, and 29.25 grams of sodium chloride, relative molecular mass 58.5, in half a litre of water. What are the concentrations, molar, of each compound? We just need to use the equation for each compound in turn. So, for potassium hydroxide, we have concentration equals weight in grams, 7, divided by the relative molecular mass, 56, all divided by the volume, 0.5, which gives us 0.25 molar. While for sodium chloride, we have concentration equals weight in grams, 29.25, divided by the relative molecular mass, 58.5, all divided by the volume, 0.5, which gives us one molar. I hope you can see in my last example that you can have different concentrations of things in the same solution. Because moles and grams are directly related, we can also easily convert between concentrations in molar to concentrations in grams per litre. But we'll look at those calculations in a separate video. For now, Remember that a mole is nothing more than an exact number of molecules. 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules, in fact. More importantly, you'll always have one mole of a compound if the mass of it in grams is the same as the compound's relative molecular mass. Because moles and mass are directly related, we can calculate all sorts of things using moles. I've given you some examples here, but we'll look at mole calculations in more detail in another video. So I hope you'll join me for that. If you're watching this video on October the 23rd, then happy Mole Day. Yes, in many parts of the world, well, America, Mole Day is celebrated from 6.02 a.m. to 6.02 p.m. on October the 23rd. I'm sure you can see why. And also why that didn't catch on in other parts of the world. If you're watching on any other day, then I hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already, so that really helps the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.